In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness. And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And the evening and the morning were the first day. God is good. And all the time. Yes, Psalm 100, verse 5. For the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting. And his truth endureth to all generations. So we thank God for his presence among us in the person of his Holy Spirit. We thank him for having preserved us during the day and having brought us to this house of worship to study his word and to fellowship one with another. I extend this welcome to those online, wherever you are, the long arm of God's love can reach you. Before I go any further, I want to answer a couple of questions that were sent, but let us pray first. Holy Father in heaven, we come to you, we are in need. What we need now are two things, forgiveness of sins if we've offended you, and wisdom to answer these questions aright. Tell me what to say, that the answers may bring light to those whom you love. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Question one. What is a regimen for memorizing scripture and quotes? Oh, <laughs> constant practice. In um, <clears throat> Mind, Character, and Personality, Volume 2, page 601, paragraph 4, Ellen White writes, that which at first seems difficult by constant repetition grows easy. That which at first seems difficult by constant, and that's where the secret lies, constant repetition grows easy. If someone were to ask your name, you would not think. You just tell your name. Even if you have 20 names, you rattle them off. We can rattle off the alphabet because we've gone over it over and over and over. You blindfold a woman, put her in her kitchen, and she can find every container of spice, of salt and sugar, and every plate and every spoon because she has memorized a map of her kitchen. So it's a matter of that what I do is constant. I woke up this morning about 2.30, couldn't fall back to sleep, so I opened the Bible, well, actually on the phone, and I started try. I'm working on a passage right now, and I began working on the passage while the rest of you were snoring very musically. And so it is constant, constant, constant practice. There are some young people who can, who can sing all the words of a lot of songs that they hear without having made a conscious effort to memorize the words. They just listen and listen and listen, and it sticks. And so my recommendation to you is constant practice. Of course, a lot of other techniques people use, uh, which you may research online, how to memorize, and you'll get a lot of information. But for me, it's constant practice. What we call practice makes perfect. All right. Question two. James 4.17 says, if you know to do good and don't do it, it is sin. Is this referring to acts, of, acts such as taking care of the widows and fatherless and loving our neighbors? Well, yes, of course. Loving your neighbor is uh, the second law of the second table of the law. If we know that there's something we ought to do and we don't do it, the Bible says that's sin, it does not mean that all the problems of the world are your responsibility. God brings to you and to me where we are. Some challenges which he requires us to respond to under his guidance and direction. So yes, if I know I ought to keep the Sabbath and I don't, it is sin. If I know I ought to return a tithe and I don't, it is sin. If I know I ought to do whatever, get to work on time, every day as much as possible and I don't, it is sin. If I know I ought to be efficient and uh, thorough in my work and I'm always sloppy, it is sin. If you know what is right, and only this book can tell you what is right, and you and I don't do it, we are guilty of sin. It's very simple. Thank you, thank you for those who sent in the questions. May the Lord bless you. Thank you very much. Our subject for today, does religion matter? Does religion matter? is our subject for today. 
I always ask you, if you're not using one of these things, please make sure that they're turned off so that they do not ring in the house of God. We want to give God reverence at all times. Am I right? Yes, of course. He deserves it. He really does. Favor number two, while I'm speaking, pray for me and say, Lord, put your words in that man's mouth. Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 9, Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said unto me, Behold, I have put my words in thy mouth. And I really want to speak God's words. And the third favor I ask is that you think as you listen. Isaiah 1.18, Come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. Let's reason. Let's reason, says God. And God is willing to come down and reason with us. Tremendous, tremendous consideration that God will do that. Let's bow our heads now and pray. Loving Father in heaven, thank you again for another day of life. We are not far from the, uh, the arrival of the holy day, and we look forward to the blessings that it brings. As we bow before you, day God, grant us your spirit. Grant us the great gift of forgiveness if we have offended you. We recommit our lives to you, day God, because we are alive by your mercy. Teach us your word tonight. Open our eyes and give us a heart to obey your word. Father, bless all those who've come in the building and those online, wherever they are, touch them, they God, because the Bible says, for God so loved the world. Put a special blessing on anyone who is not a Seventh-day Adventist. Touch them in a very personal way, they God, and preserve or reserve a sweet blessing for little boys and little girls who are listening. Bless this country, they God. Guide the leaders, Father. Somehow let them know that they are under the control of the president of the universe, and that is you. Father, bless every country represented by those listening. Now, dear God, I humble myself before you. Use me for your glory and that your people might be blessed. Heal the sick. Remove COVID-19 from anyone so afflicted. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. What's our subject? Does religion matter? I have met several people in my lifetime who are absolutely opposed to organized religion. I mean, just opposed. They say, give me Jesus and keep organized religion. Let me direct your mind to what Jesus told the Israelites. Now, why? when I say Jesus, I keep saying Jesus, particularly when I refer to the Old Testament, because you need to get it into your consciousness. The God of the Old Testament is the same person who walked the streets of Galilee, Jesus Christ. The one who appeared to Moses in the burning bush was Jesus Christ. The one who spoke to Abraham was Jesus Christ. Why is that? The instant Adam sinned, the father ceased all direct communication with mankind. The Bible says there's one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. 1 Timothy 2 verse 5, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And so the God of the Old Testament is Jesus Christ, of course, as an agent of the Father. Now let's look at what Jesus told the Israelites. Let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 18. We read from verse 9. Our subject, does religion matter? Deuteronomy chapter 18, we read from verse 9. Book number 5. Do you have that? If you have, say amen. When thou art come into the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee, thou shalt not learn to do after the abominations of these nations. Now, those nations, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, the Jebusites, the Cadmonites, the Kenizzites, the Kenites, you name it, all the ites that occupied that particular land God promised to Israel. They had their religious practices. When God told the Israelites, do not mingle with those nations, they were religious nations because they had their religions. But their religion was not the religion of the God of heaven and earth. Is that clear? They had their religions. Now, 
God knows he's bringing the Israelites into a land occupied by people who did not recognize the God of heaven and earth. Here is what God tells uh, the Israelites through Moses. Let's keep reading. They shall not be found among you. Deuteronomy 18 verse 10. Anyone that maketh his son or his daughter to pass through the fire. Give me one expression or one, what would you call that? Make your son or daughter pass through the fire. Human sacrifice. Human sacrifice was practiced by those tribes. And there's some evidence a little of it was done by the Israelites. So God says, they shall not be found among you, anyone, not even one person, that maketh his son or his daughter to pass through the fire, or that useth divination, or an observer of times, or an enchanter, or a witch, or a charmer, or a consulter with familiar spirits, or a wizard, or a necromancer. So you have those, that list, verses 10 and 11. All of those refer to religious practices of those nations. They had their religions. God gave the Israelites a different religion. For all that do these things are an abomination unto the Lord. God said all these things are abominations. Now, an abomination is an intense form of sin. What do I mean by that? God hates all sin. But abominations really get under his skin. It is something he absolutely detests and loathes. He hates all sin, but abominations receive uh, his most... It's like God spitting sulfuric acid when he sees abominations. And he tells his people... Do not practice these abominations. And he lists them, human sacrifice, go to diviners, observers of times, reading the stars, enchanters, witches, charmers, consultors with familiar spirits. You go to a witch doctor, he talks to your dead grandmother. Wizards, necromancers. Again, those who involve themselves with the dead. God told the Israelites, do not do that now. Keep this in mind and go to Acts 7. The book of Acts, chapter 7. We'll read the first part of verse 38. Our subject, Does Religion Matter? It's 11, 12 minutes after 6. I'll release you by 7. If I need to go beyond, I'll ask for your permission. What book did I say? Acts. What chapter? 7. What verse? 38. Are you there? Let me pray again. Father, as I continue, please grant me more of your spirit. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. This is he that was where? In the church. Where was the church? In the wilderness. Stop. How does the Bible refer to the Israelites in the wilderness? The church. There were gods and they had no building. Because a church is not a building. A, church, a building is the place where the church meets. And so the name passes to the building. A building is not really a church. The church is a reference to the people, the house of God, the people. And so the Israelites in the wilderness are referred to as the church in the wilderness. And God tells that church, do not behave like those churches. That's not being politically incorrect or thinking you're better than somebody else. God isn't telling them be better than. He's telling them be different from. Are you with me? Be different from. If you're playing basketball, you don't wear a helmet. Are you following me? You wear sneakers, shorts, and a tank top. You don't wear a helmet and cleats. That's for the football field, not for the basketball court. Are you with me? Be different from these nations because their practices upset me. And if you do what they do, I will deal with you as I am dealing with them. Does religion matter? In the book of Exodus, chapter 18, God gave information to Moses through Jethro, his father-in-law. Jethro told Moses, he's taking on too many duties and responsibilities. He will wear away. And Jethro suggested... Pick some spiritual men hmm? and put them over thousands, hundreds, fifties, and tens. 
that is religious organization. They will handle the small matters, the matters that are difficult, Moses, will come to you because you are the highest official over that nation because the Israelites were in some sense a nation in the wilderness, a church nation, a nation church. And um, Aaron was the highest spiritual official. He was the pastor. Moses was the overall leader under God's direction. This is an organized church. Church organization was invented by Christ. You could not do whatever you wanted. There was uh, Aaron, the high priest. Then he had Levites under him. There were things the Levites could do, things Aaron did. Whatever a Levite did, Aaron could do. Whatever Aaron did, a Levite couldn't do. Let me say that slowly. Aaron could do what any Levite did. The Levites couldn't do everything Aaron did. Only Aaron could enter the most holy place on what day? The day of atonement, only the high priest, Aaron, not the Levite. So we have levels of responsibility and we have degrees of privilege. When God called Moses into the mount, he told him, no one else must come up with you, only you. If anyone else comes close as you have come, that person is dead. God organized his church in the wilderness. Organized religion is an invention of God, but for the glory of God and for the blessing of his people. Now, let's go to Exodus 19. Our subject, does religion matter? Exodus 19, we read from verse 4. God speaking to Moses, and he gives words to Moses that Moses was supposed to tell the Israelites. You have Exodus 19? We read from verse 4. And God tells Moses, Moses is up with God in the mountain. He have seen what I did unto the Egyptians, and how I bear you on eagles' wings and brought you unto myself. Now, therefore, if ye will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. And ye shall be unto me what? A kingdom of priests, keep reading, and a holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. Let's look at that verse again. And ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests. That sounds spiritual. And an holy nation. Now you may think nation is secular, but they are to be a holy nation. And so all during the week, the Israelites were to be a holy nation. A kingdom of priests. This was God's desire for the Israelites. But listen to the condition upon which this was based. Now, this is Exodus chapter 19. You have seen what I did unto the Egyptians, verse 4, and how I bear you on eagles' wings and brought you unto myself. Now, therefore, if ye will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then he shall be a peculiar treasure unto me. Now the word voice is significant because in the very next chapter, they heard the literal voice of God. And so it's reasonable, reasonable for us to connect the voice in, verse, in chapter 19 with that which they heard in the very next chapter, only three days later. Because God told Moses, they need three days to prepare. Uh, if you will obey my voice indeed, and when the voice of God spoke in chapter 20, what did that voice declare? The Ten Commandments, that was it. Chapter 20, reading from verse 1. And God spake all these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage, then he begins, thou shalt have no other gods before me. Now immediately, God is telling them, do not be like the Egyptians out of whose country you came, nor like the, the, the nations into which country you're going. The reason why the Israelites worshipped the golden calf in Exodus 32, that's what they had seen where? In Egypt. By the way, from time to time, young people say to me, is it okay if I come to church on Sabbath? Yes, it's a Sabbath. But can I go to that church and that church on Sunday? <laughs> and I say to them, look, are you able to defend, thus saith the Lord? Can you defend the doctrines of this church? Why place yourself deliberately in error? 
the, Egypt, the Israelites immediately turn, when I say immediately, after not seeing Abra uh, Moses for quite a while, their natural behavior was to go back to what they had seen in Egypt. When they got to the borders of Canaan 40 years later, they went, the men went to see how the Moabites worshipped. And they came back with Moabite women. They went to see and came back with Moabite women practicing Moabite behavior, which was religious. <laughs> and God had to kill thousands of them. It is dangerous to go see. Jesus said, if they shall say, he is in the desert or he's in the secret place, don't believe it and don't go. There are some people who say, well, I'm an adult. I can watch that movie. It won't bother me. Wrong. Wrong. Because once it gets into the mind, it's effect, it affects you and you cannot get it out. And so God told them, thou shalt have no other gods before me because the Egyptians worship many, many gods. If you examine the plagues that God sent upon Egypt, each plague attacked an Egyptian god. Each plague. And so God told them, if ye will obey my voice indeed. And what did that voice say? The Ten Commandments. Now, let me give you some other evidence why the Ten Commandments was a central document for God's organized religion. And why you ought to consider God's commandments when you're looking for a religion today. In the Patriarchs and Prophets, page 125, paragraph 1. What book? What page? What paragraph? Listen carefully. After the dispersion from Babel, you know God confused the languages and they scattered. Idolatry again became well nigh universal all over the world. And the Lord finally left the hardened transgressors to follow the evil ways while he chose Abraham of the line of Shem and made him the keeper of his law for sacred oracles. Uh, the line of Seth, and make him his, his, the keeper of his law for future generations. God made Abraham the keeper of his law for future generations because most of the world had gone off into idolatry. Let me say it again. God found one family on earth. <laughs> Did you hear what I said? One family in the earth that did not mix his religion with paganism, and God called Abraham. Now, God called Abraham from his family. Now, that's tough. Because nothing means more to us than family. And we all understand that. God, because his family, mixed God's religion with the religion of those around them. And God brought Abraham out of that. There can be no mixing. Now, the same page, 125, of Patriarchs and Prophets, lower down in that paragraph, she writes, He communicated his will to Abraham and gave him a distinct understanding of the requirements of his law. Now, we read earlier in the paragraph, he called Abraham to make him a keeper of his law for future generations. Now, she says, he communicated his will to Abraham and gave him a distinct understanding of the requirements of his law. Now, let's go to page 126 of Patriarchs and Prophets, our subject, Does Religion Matter? In order that God might qualify him for his great work as the keeper of the sacred oracles. Now, in page 125, she says the law. In page 125 again, she says the law. In page 126, she says the sacred oracles. The sacred oracles can refer to God's revealed will generally, but more importantly, it refers to the spinal cord of God's requirements for us, and that is the Ten Commandments. Now, go to Romans chapter 3. Romans 3, let's read from verse 1. Our subject, what is it? Does religion matter? The answer is yes. The question is, which one? Do you have Romans chapter 3? We read from verse 1. Before we read, let's get some background from chapter 1 and chapter 2 of the book of Romans. In chapter 1, Paul presents the Gentiles as in need of Christ. They need 
Christ. In chapter 2, Paul presents the Jews as in need of Christ. <laughs> Are you following me? In other words, there is no difference Paul is saying between the two. Now, can you imagine Jews listening to that in the days of Paul? Knowing they're God's favorite people. And so Paul now, in chapter 3 now, having lumped the, the Gentiles in chapter 1 with the Jews in chapter 2, they both need Christ. In chapter 3, the first verse he said, what? What? What advantage then have the Jew or what profit is there? Now, what, what's the point in being a Jew? If we're no different from the Gentile, we both need Jesus or salvation. What advantage then have the Jew? Or what profit is there in circumcision? Now, the word circumcision sometimes refers to the actual physical operation. It also refers to everything Jewish. Are you following me? The word was so central to the Israelites, it became the expression for the Jewish lifestyle. They were simply called the circumcision, and Gentiles were called the uncircumcision. Are you with me? And so when Paul says, oh, what profit is there of circumcision, what's the point in following the Jewish lifestyle? Verse 2, how does that verse begin? Much everywhere. Why? Finish the verse. Chiefly because, uh huh, unto them, we're committed. Ah. Mm-hmm. What made the Israelites different from all the surrounding nations? They had God's law given to them directly. And God's law is his will. The other nations probably had aspects of the law in shadow. They had a sense of right and wrong. The law was given directly to the Israelites. And Paul says it is an advantageous thing to be a part of the Israelite nation. You are part of a nation to whom directly God gave his law, the divine oracles. And as we read in uh, Acts 7.38, Moses with the church in the wilderness who received the divine oracles to give to our fathers. The Bible identifies the, the giving of God's law to the Israelites as the chief reason why they were special above everybody else because the law is the will of God. Now, Patriarchs and Prophets, page 364, paragraph 2. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 364, paragraph 2. Listen very carefully. If man had kept the law of God as given to Adam after his fall, preserved by Noah and observed by Abraham, there would have been no need for the ordinance of circumcision. And if the descendants of Abraham had kept the covenant of which circumcision was a sign, they would never have been seduced into idolatry nor would it have been necessary for them to suffer a life of bondage in Egypt. They would have kept God's law in mind and there would have been no necessity for it to be proclaimed upon Sinai or engraved upon the tables of stone. Here's how it ends. And if the people had practiced the principles of the Ten Commandments, there would have been no need for the additional directions given to Moses. That's the kind of quotation you have to go over again. Because the essence of that is what God wanted from Abraham's people was obedience to his law. If they had done that, God would not have given Abraham circumcision. If they had observed the covenant after circumcision, God would not have the need to proclaim his law from Sinai or write it on tables of stone. It was constant disobedience that led God to take these steps. And after proclaiming the law, if they had followed it, he would not have given them all the other directions that you find from Exodus to uh, Deuteronomy. This is what God has always wanted, is his law in the life of his people. Because the law is an expression of the life of Christ. Now, go to Exodus 25 as we continue. Does religion matter? Exodus 25, you know this verse very well. Let's read verse 8 of Exodus 25. Say it with me. And let them... Oh, you're not there yet? Okay. Are you there? And let them do what? Make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. Now... Think with me. 
make a sanctuary so that I might dwell among them. Okay? Let's take a broad look at the sanctuary. It was surrounded by a fence that's white. The white fence represented what? The righteousness of Jesus Christ. Then there was an outer court which had the altar of sacrifice where the animals were burned. All right? Next to the first uh, veil was the, the laver, and there was a place where the animals were tied before they were killed. That was the outer court. After the outer court now, there was the holy place. In the holy place were the table of shewbread, the seven branch candelabrum, and the altar of incense. The altar of incense right up against the veil that separated the holy place from the most holy place. The table of shewbread towards the north, the candelabrum towards the south, I believe it is now. Then the most holy place, we have the ark, which contained the Ten Commandments. And the only reason why the ark was sacred was because it contained the ten. That's the only reason why they were not allowed to touch it. Because of what it contained. Are you with me? So the ark itself was not the thing. Its contents, because it contained the two tables of stone, which God told Moses to place therein, Exodus 25, 16 and 25, 21, put the law in that ark, the presence of the Ten Commandments made that box sacred. Don't touch it. Not touching the ark simply meant not touching the law. Are you following me? Now, this is God telling the Israelites what to do. Listen carefully. The outer court was holy. Reserved. You can only come there to bring a sacrifice. You can put your animals there to graze. You and the animal would die. The holy place was holy. The most holy represented God's very presence. And only the law was there. Are you with me? Could God have put the law in the outer court? Could he, if he wanted to? Yes. But God put the law in that part of the sanctuary referred to as the most holy, the very presence of God. And the ark contained the law, and the Shekinah light hovered just above that box that contained the law, and that represented the constant presence of God. The symbolic value is the throne of God is based on his law. Let me ask you this. Think with me. If there had been no sin, would there be a Bible? Come on, talk to me. No. If there had been no sin, would there be the testimonies and patriarchs and prophets? No. If there had been no sin, would there be the righteous law of God? Yes. My brothers and sisters, when God organized Israel into a religion, also a nation, it was a religious nation, God gave them a standard of behavior. And that standard was the Ten Commandments. Are you with me? That standard has not changed. It has not changed. Let's jump several thousand years ahead. And go to Revelation. Revelation chapter 12, our subject, does religion matter? The answer is yes. But the critical issue is, which one? As the Bible says, the Lord's many and God's many, then the religion's many and church's many. Revelation 12, let's read from verse 1. And there appeared a great wonder in heaven. I hope someone is praying for me, saying, Lord, put your words in that man's mouth. And there appeared a great wonder in heaven. A woman clothed with the sun. Read with me. And the moon under her feet. And upon her head, what? A crown of stars. It's 25 to 7. Tell me about the sun. When was it made? Day 4. So was the moon, and so were the stars. Let's go to Genesis 1. We read from verse 14, our subject, does religion matter? 
I have not yet received a rebuke tonight, but I'm waiting. What book did I say? What chapter? Reading from what verse? 14. Father in heaven, continue to be with me, I pray, please, in Jesus' name, amen. And God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night. And let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. And let them be for what? Lights in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth. And it was so. Now, based on what you just read, what was one of the major functions of the sun, the moon, the stars? To give light upon the earth. Let that sink in for a few seconds. To give light upon. Now, the Bible explains itself. Now, let's go back to Revelation 12. Reading from verse 1. Are you there? And there appeared a great wonder in heaven. A woman, come on now, you read, clothed with the sun. Come on. The moon under her feet. And upon her head, a crown of twelve. Now, Adventists interpret that to be uh, the 12 stars of the apostles and the moon is the Old Testament, the, the, the sun is the new. I have no quarrel with that, but I want you to think beyond that. We have the sun. What was one of the functions of the sun? To give light upon the earth. What was one of the functions of the moon? To give light upon the earth. What was the major function of the stars? To give light upon the earth. Then, the woman is clothed with the sun. The moon under her feet. Upon her head, a crown of 12 stars. What is she surrounded by from top to bottom, back and front? Light. How much light? All the light. Because only the sun, the moon, and the stars were commissioned to give light upon the earth. She is surrounded, clothed, top to bottom, back and front, with all the light. Now this is revelation. We're talking about the end times. Let me modify what I mean by all the light. All the light needed for these times. And we call that what? Present truth. If she has all the light, all the present truth, where am I going? Where am I going? Notice I said all the light required for these times. Go to Revelation 14. You've heard of the three angels' messages? Of course you have. Read from verse 6 of Revelation 14. Are you there? You know, I should tell you just read it without looking, but I'll be merciful. Okay, let's read together. What does that say? And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come, and worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. Message number one of the three angels. Now, let's go to verse 8. What does that say? And... They followed another angel saying what? Babylon has fallen, is fallen, that great nation. Why? Because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of a fornication. And the most terrible warning in all the Bible is found in verses 9 through 11. And the third angel followed them saying with a loud voice, come on, read. If any man worship the beast, come on. On his image, and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. Keep reading, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the Lamb and in the presence of the... Now, this is the most solemn warning in the Bible. After those three messages, read verse 14. And I looked... Come on. And I looked, and behold, 
a white cloud. Come on. And upon the cloud, one sat like unto the Son of Man, having in his hand, on his head a golden crown, and in his hand... Now, in other words, right after these messages, what happens? Christ comes. That's why they are the final messages for this earth. That's what that woman has that no one else has. Other churches have baptism by immersion. We thank you. Other churches have the second coming. Yes, fine. Other churches have salvation by fine. Only this church has been committed to preach the three angels of Revelation 14, 6 to 12. You will never hear a message on that subject except from an Adventist pulpit. Because even though it is in the Bible and available to everyone, not everyone has been called to preach it. Does religion matter? Yes. These are the three messages that prepare the world for the second coming of Christ. Now let's go back to verse 14. Let me uh, strengthen that point about the second coming of Christ and the function of these three messages. As we continue, does religion matter? Is 20 minutes to 7. And I looked and behold, what? A white cloud. And upon the cloud, one sat like under the Son of Man, having on his head a what? Golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle stop. There's a crown on his head. Not a mitre. The priest, when functioning, wore a mitre with a saying, Holiness under the Lord. Christ the priest is no longer priest when you see him on that cloud. His priestly work is done. Now some churches tell you when Christ comes, there's an opportunity to repent. Wrong. If he came as a priest, he would have a mitre, not a crown. He's coming with a crown. He would have a censer as a priest, not a sickle. The word sickle appears 11 times in the Bible. Six times in Revelation 14. Did you hear what I said? Eleven times in the Bible, six times Revelation 14. And each time it's used, it's connected to the harvest, which means cutting down, separating ripe from whatever. Verse 15 of Revelation 14. Read that for me. What does that say? And another angel came out of the temple, keep reading, crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud, thrust in thy sickle and reap. For the time is come for thee to reap. Finish the verse. For the harvest of the earth is ripe. That's right after those three messages. The harvest of the earth. Who is the harvest of the earth? The people. They have come to a final position regarding me. Read verse 16. And he that sat on the cloud, thrust in the sickle in the earth, and the earth was reaped. Verse 17, and another angel came out of where? Temple which is in heaven, he also having a sharp sickle. 18, and another angel came out of the, which had power over, and cried with a loud cry to him that had the sharp sickle, saying what? Thrust in the sharp sickle, and gather the what? Vine of the earth, for her grapes are? What's the last word in verse 18? What's the last word in verse 18? What's the last word in verse 15? How many harvests are there? Two. I'm going to quickly. Let me back off. I don't want you to get a migraine. The last word in verse 15 is right. The last word in verse 18 is right. And we have two harvests. The harvest that's right in 1516. The harvest that's right in 18 and 19. Read verse 19 for me now. What does that say? And the angel... And gathered and cast it where? Into the great winepress of the wrath of God. Now, if that harvest of 18 and 19 is cast into the great winepress of the wrath of God, who are we talking about? The wicked. Then what's the harvest in 15 and 16? The righteous, because the only two. What does it mean to be ripe? Listen, ready. All right, what else? Now, this is spiritual, religious. We don't know people. Here's God's law. And the world is split into two groups. Those who obey it and those who disobey it. Those who obey it are ripe. 
which means nothing the world can do. Let me say it differently. Nothing Satan can do. Can do what? Change their minds. That's ripe. The other harvest is also ripe. <laughs> nothing God can do will change their minds. Now, when God can do nothing to change your mind, I mean, that's right. There are some people who are so opposed to God. If God hits them with a disease to open their eyes, it doesn't work. Hits them with poverty, it doesn't work. They're absolutely opposed to God and his law, right? Then there are those like Daniel in the lion's den, 43 Hebrew boys in the fiery furnace. Regardless of what the devil does, they prefer to die than disappoint God. That's, what, that, that's the condition the world must come to. And the messages that bring the world to that condition are the three angels' messages. So then you have to ask yourself, where is that church? Go to John 10. Our subject does religion matter. John 10. Listen to Christ who loves everybody. Notice I said Christ loves everybody. Read verse 16 of John 10. What does the Bible say? And other sheep I have which are not of this fold. Stop. Think with me. Give me another word for fold. Church. Then what is Jesus saying? Other sheep I have which are not of my church. Keep reading. Them also I must bring. Stop. There's something called sheep stealing. It's not really sheep stealing. God doesn't steal what's his. Notice he says, other sheep I have. They are in other churches. Jesus says, I've got to bring them. That's not sheep stealing. But how does he bring them? And they shall hear what? My voice. This is the voice of God. And there shall be one fold. Come on. One shepherd. Before Christ comes, the world will be split into two. Very clearly. Those who obey God and those who don't. I'm not saying every, there'll be just two churches, Adventists, and everyone else becomes some. No, no, no. Catholic will be Catholic, Baptist, Baptist, Lutheran, Lutheran. But what unites them will be opposition to God's law. The Sadducees did not like the Pharisees. They had different beliefs. The Sadducees did not believe in angels and the resurrection. The Pharisees did. And at one point when Paul was being tried, he caused a confusion between the Pharisees. The Liberians, they started arguing and Paul, they did, the Zealots were a different group. The Herodians were a different group. The Pharisees were one. The, they all united on one point. Kill Jesus. Other sheep I have, which are not of this fold. How do you identify that fold? Go to Revelation 12. We read 7 and we read 17. Are you there? And may the God of heaven and earth continue to give me wisdom. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. And the dragon fought and his angels and prevailed not, neither was their place found any more in heaven. There was war in heaven. Verse 9 says, And the great dragon was cast out. That old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceived the whole world, he was cast out into the earth. And his angels were cast out with him now. When Christ met Paul, he was Saul then, on the road to Damascus. When I say he was Saul then, there's biblical evidence he had two names. Usually he, used, he would use Saul, now after Christ he began to use Paul, but that doesn't matter. Christ said to him, Saul, Saul, what? Why persecutest thou me? But whom was Paul persecuting? The early church. Christ raised them. Then what do we learn from the words of Christ? Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And Saul said, who are you? Because Paul thought he was persecuting the church. So what do we understand about Christ and the church? Whatever touches us, touches him. Are you with me? That's how closely connected Christ is with his church. Closely connected to his church. Now Christ says, 
other sheep I have which are not of this fold they have to come and it shall be one fold and one shepherd now we read Revelation 12 7 there was war in heaven Satan cast out to the earth with his angels now and I showed you what happens to the church happens to Christ very clear also what happens to Christ happens to the Father whatever Christ suffers the Father feels so when Christ was suffering on the cross the Father was suffering but that's another story now look at verse 17 read with me and the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of a seed which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ now in verse 7 the war is between Christ and Satan directly in verse 17 the same war a different battleground now he's cast out from heaven but it's the same war but he's out of heaven he can't get to Christ how does he get to Christ through the church because what happens to the church happens to Christ whoever touches the church touches the apple of his eye and so the Bible says the dragon was wroth with the woman which woman which keep the commandments of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ when we read Revelation 14 those three powerful messages verse 12 tells us here is the patience of the Saints here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus are you looking for a church to attend in these terrible last days look for a church that respects the law of God I did not say look for a church with perfect people you will not find it Jesus pastored the early church made up of the 12 disciples he was the pastor he said have I not chosen you 12 one of you come on is a devil in the early church the foundational church the foundation stone the 12 disciples the pastor Jesus Christ said one of you is a devil so one twelfth of the early church was devilish and the pastor was Jesus then what about today did not Jesus say let the wheat and the tares grow together you do not choose a church based on how well the members dress the question must be what does the church teach does that church respect the law of God now let's go to John chapter 6 we're coming to the end our subject does religion matter John 6 let's read from verse 66 Jesus had said eat my flesh drink my blood verse 53 all the way down eat my flesh drink my blood of course the Jews was, were outraged by that because they did not consume blood but they never understood what Christ was saying verse 66 the Bible says from that time come on read with me many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him what does verse 67 say then said Jesus unto the twelve will ye also go away stop many disciples the Bible says many left him they were leaving in such large numbers that Jesus felt wait a minute <laughs> the 12 closest to me are about to leave so he says to them are you leaving too read verse 68 for me then Simon Peter or Simon answered and said what Lord to whom shall we go come on thou hast the words of eternal life now you tell me what reason did Peter give why he and the other would stay what was the reason what Christ was teaching you choose a church based on what it teaches not on the size of the pastor's salary or how many Mercedes Benz are parked or if the church has a pipe organ or a famous choir what does it teach and the Bible identifies God's last day church as a church that keeps the commandments of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ here's the patience of the saints here they that keep the commandments of God the war that Satan began in heaven continues on the earth because Christ is in heaven and Satan can't get to him Satan gets to him through the church which Jesus Christ organized way back in the wilderness continued in the New Testament church if there's someone listening to me 
I want you to make every effort to attend the nearest Seventh-day Adventist church near you tomorrow, if at all possible. Not because they're perfect, but because we uphold the law of God, which is an expression of the very righteousness of Christ. Let me say again, we're not perfect, but we are following God's requirement that we magnify his law. That was one of the predictions that Christ would carry out. He would magnify the law and make it honorable, and we make God's law honorable by connecting his law to himself. I say again, the law of God is an expression of the very life and character and righteousness of God. That's why when David sinned, he, gets, he said, against thee, thee only have I sinned, but he had broken commandment seven. When Joseph was tempted, he said, how can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? Because he realized, to break the law is to disgrace God. The law of God and the character of God are one. And God says, I have a people who will keep before the world my law, which is my character, which is the standard of righteousness, which is the passport to the kingdom, which is the very life of Christ. The Ten Commandments, Christ is the law lived. What we have written here is the law written. Let me say it again. Christ is the law lived, which we read in his book. He is the living law. I often refer to it this way. An architect draws plans for a house. Are you following me? That those plans have where every light bulb will go, every outlet, the, the plumbing, the windows, the roof, the place for the, 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 the dryer, the washer, the stove. All of that is in that plan. That house is merely the living representation of that plan. When the architect looks at the plan, he sees the house. Now, I may not see it, you see. I just see squiggly lines. He sees a house. The law of God, written, is the architectural plan for a righteous life. When that life is lived, it is Christ. How else can I tell you? You take some sugar, some salt, ten ingredients, some yeast, some whatever, and you have all the ingredients of a cake. When you bake that cake, ah, that's, the, that's, that's, that, that's, that's Christ. All the ingredients, ten ingredients, that's the law. Put together... That's Christ the cake. God has a church in these last days called upon by God to magnify his law, which is the blueprint for a righteous life. And a righteous life is any life that reflects the character of Christ. And so Jesus could say, if ye keep my commandments, he shall abide in my love. The word abide, men, or the Greek word means to remain, to continue to stay. Even as I have kept my father's commandments and abide in his love. How did Christ remain on good grounds with the father? Constant obedience to the father's law. And the father's law also happens to be Christ's law. My brothers and sisters, the Seventh-day Adventist church is not a perfect church. We have hypocrites, we have whatever, we have those who represent the devil as Judas represented Satan, but Christ was still the pastor. Are you following me? And God has given to this church a commission. The three angels' messages, and the very first message, glorify God, and the only way to glorify God is to obey God. And obedience to God is condensed in his law. And so again, I say to my friends in person, online, I call upon you, I urge you, make plans to visit the nearest Seventh-day Adventist church. You can tell them, we sent you, or I sent you. Tell them that. That preacher sent me, and they will receive you. Remember, you're not going into a church with perfect people. You're going into the church with a commission from God to preach a special message to prepare the world for the coming of Jesus Christ. Does religion matter? Yes. Who came up with the idea of organized religion? Jesus Christ. And it will remain until he comes. How many of you will say, Father, 
Keep me faithful to the truth regardless of what other people do. Can I see your right hand? Keep me faithful to this truth. Stand with me. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word. As always, if I have preached badly, forgive me. I'll try to do better the next time. Father, your word says, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. In other words, what is there to life? Fear God and keep his commandments. For this is the whole duty of mankind. The language is so simple, dear God. Fear God, in other words, recognize who you are and keep your commandments. That's the whole duty. Give us the grace to carry out that duty, dear God, that our lives may glorify your name from morning to evening, day in and day out. Write that law on our hearts, dear God, that obedience becomes not an act we carry out, but a lifestyle empowered by your grace. To those listening who have been touched by the message, I have asked them, dear God, to make arrangements to visit the nearest Seventh-day Adventist church. Make it possible for them to do that. And as they do, give them that consciousness that they are in the church where you would have them to be. And remember the words of your son in John 10, 16. Other sheep I have, which are not of this fold. Wherever they are, bring them, Father, bring them, I pray. Under the banner of truth. Take us home safely. Bring us back tomorrow night, I pray. Until then, keep us under your care. In Jesus' name, I pray. Let God's people say, Amen and Amen. You may be seated.